This rock I'm holding is 1.3 billion years old, give or take a few tens of millions of years, which when you're talking about those timescales isn't too bad at all. But how do we know when a particular rock forms? There's no handy date and time on it to tell us when it was formed, but inside there's a tiny special kind of clock that's been quietly ticking away the ages. Learning how to read these rock clocks is super important, not just for understanding the age of the Earth, but also for understanding the timing and duration of geological events. That includes everything from the evolution of life through to the movement of entire continental plates. And some of those geochronometers are the subject of today's Secrets of Geology. Hi, I'm Brooke and I'm a geologist. Welcome to the channel where I show you the secrets of geology and how to read the story that's written in the rocks. I'd really appreciate it if you hit the subscribe button and leave the video a thumbs up because there's loads more cool earth science content on the way for you over the next few months and beyond. Understanding the ages of the rocks is really important, not just so we know the age of the earth, but so we can know when things happened and how long things took to happen. There are a number of different ways that we can do this, but the methods are generally divided into relative ages and absolute ages. You can't see me doing this with my hands, probably for the best. A relative age might not have a specific date assigned to it. It might rely on the con physical contact between rocks. For example, if we dug a deep hole on a beach, we would be pretty sure that the sand at the top of the hole would be younger and had been deposited later than the sand at the bottom of the hole. We don't have exact dates for the horizons at the top of the hole and the bottom of the hole. We just know the sand at the top is younger than the sand at the bottom. Absolute dating allows us to paint a fairly precise age onto a rock or a geological event. If we dug our hole on the beach and found a layer of volcanic ash, we would be able to use the radioactive minerals within that ash layer to get a fairly precise date on when the ash had been erupted to within a few millions or even a few thousand years. From that age, we could then infer the relative ages of the sand that was above the ash layer and below the ash layer. So now let's have a look at some of the most common methods for dating rocks. The physical ordering of rocks is called the stratigraphic relationship. Stratigraphy is just a fancy way of saying the order of a particular set of rocks. Let's go back to our beach example. Let's assume that tens or even hundreds of millions of years have passed, new sediment has been deposited and the environment of the beach has changed to something else. The stratigraphy, if we were to dig down through those rocks, might look something like this. Assuming that the rocks don't get deformed and remain flat lying, this is kind of how we would see them in a cliff face or an outcrop section. We would know that this red sandstone here came first and that the other sediments came later. So they're all relatively younger. What if we find a rock like this that's got other rocks inside it? How can we find out which one is relatively older and relatively younger? We can now have a go at working this out by looking at how the rocks are in contact with each other and this is their stratigraphic relationship. This conglomerate sand contains these round pebbles of chert and limestone. We know that the chert and limestone is from lower down in the stratigraphy and therefore is older and that it must have already been a hard rock for it to be eroded into the nice round pebbles we see in here. So these pebbles inside the sandstone are older than the sandstone that contains them. This is called the law of included fragments. How about if we found some igneous rocks sandwiched in between our sedimentary rocks? These igneous rocks could have been erupted onto the surface and then had sedimentary rocks deposited on top of them and therefore could be in the right sequence. The first thing to do to help us work this out would be to identify what kind of igneous rock it was. Was it one that was erupted onto the surface or was it one that was intruded inside other rocks at depth? In our example, this gabbro has large crystals that must have cooled slowly at depth so we know it didn't erupt onto the surface where the crystals would have cooled quickly and been much smaller. The hot rock also cooked and recrystallized the surrounding sedimentary rocks, which must have already become hard stone when the gabbro intruded. 
So now we know that the gabbro is at least younger than the rocks that surround it. Igneous rocks that intrude along the bedding plane of the surrounding or country rock are called sills, which is an old word for shelf. Intrusions that cut across the bedding of the country rock are called dikes, which is an old word for wall. Cross-cutting relationships also tell us that the intruding rock is younger than the country rock because the country rocks had to be there and lithified for the intrusion to cut across them. Dikes and sills don't have to be made of igneous rock. They can also be made of sediments and metamorphic rocks as well. So our beach example is really nice and simple. Once you start getting into more complex terrain where there have been continental collisions and uplift and erosion, things get a little bit more complicated. Rocks can be folded and even completely overturned so they're upside down. Mapping and working in these areas is actually kind of really exciting trying to work it all out. Sedimentary rocks often contain fossils as well, like this beautiful Amalthius ammonite. As well as telling us about ancient life and evolution, fossils like this can also help us date rocks, and this is called biostratigraphy. Certain organisms have resistant body parts and fossilize really well. When these organisms are restricted to a particular time range, but found all over the world, they can make really useful biostratigraphic markers. Some examples of common fossils that make good markers are ammonites, trilobites and graptolites, microfossils like Foraminifera, radiolaria, conodonts, algae and plant spores and pollen also make excellent biostratigraphic markers because there are so many of them and they are found all over the world and they also look really really cool. Looking at our example, if we find specific fossils in each layer, we can start to tie down the dating of these rocks even more. There are a few snags though. Not all sedimentary rocks contain fossils that are usable. In fact, not all sedimentary rocks contain any fossils at all. While some creatures, such as the lingular brachiopods, have been around forever and have a very long temporal range. Fossils like this though can only really help us in rocks from the last 542 million years. And even though the large body fossils go back to about 570 million years, they have limited biostratigraphic use. Rocks older than 570 million years have no large body fossils in them, and the microfossils that they do contain all tend to look the same, so they have very limited stratigraphic use. This is where absolute dating can be a huge help. You might already know that the Earth has a magnetic field that's produced by the liquid outer core of the planet sloshing around. Rocks can also detect this magnetic field thanks to tiny mineral grains that line up with the magnetic field at the time that the rock is formed. As the Earth's magnetic poles and field have moved around and even reversed over geological time, different rocks will record different field and pole positions. If we know roughly when the Earth's magnetic pole and field were in those positions, we can work out how old the rock is. The main source of heat inside our planet is the breakdown of radioactive elements like uranium that have been trapped down there since the Earth formed. Without going into too much detail, the heavy elements like uranium break down by emitting an alpha particle, which is two protons and two neutrons, and then converting into a lighter decay product, a new element. Uranium, for example, breaks down into thorium. This radioactive decay occurs at a known rate, and by measuring the amount of heavy element, compared to the lighter decay product, we can work out how old the rock is. It's sort of like watching sand trickle through an egg timer, only the sand is a stream of tiny alpha particles inside a mineral grain. Once half the sand has gone, we know that a set period of time has passed. This is called the half-life of the element, not the kind of half-life with Gordon Freeman and Ed Grant. Different elements have different half-lives and so are useful over different time scales. A common example is carbon-14 dating. C14 has a half-life of about five and a half thousand years, and that means it can be used to reliably date material that's 50,000 years or younger. Samples also have to contain organic carbon to use the C14 method, so it's not very good for dating inorganic materials like rocks or things that are older than 50,000 years, like most rocks. If you want to do older and inorganic material, then you're best off using the uranium lead method. U238 has a half-life of about 4.4 billion years, and U235 has a half-life of about 700 million years, so they're able to be used to date any rocks on Earth 
and even rocks from around the solar system like asteroids and meteors. Of course, as with C14, the uranium lead method has its own catches. You have to have minerals that contain radioactive uranium in them, for example. This mostly restricts its use to dating rocks of igneous and metamorphic origin. The uranium lead technique can also be applied to some carbonate rocks, but in that case there's a, a lower precision. However, if you want to date non-carbonate sediments, then you can date the uranium lead in zircons and other igneous and metamorphic minerals that have turned up as detrital grains in sandy sediments. This doesn't give you the exact time of deposition, but it does give you a much narrower window, sometimes down to a few tens of millions of years. And if you're working on billion year timescales, that's actually pretty good. And that's exactly how my rock was dated. Bo Yang at Adelaide University collected hundreds of uranium lead dates from detrital zircons that he found within these rocks. From this, it was calculated that deposition of the sediment must have taken place around 1,350 million years ago, or 1.3 billion years, plus or minus 40 million years. That 40 million year window may sound huge, but when you're working on billion year timescales, 40 million years is not too big a margin. This video is just scratching the surface of the different ways that we date rocks, particularly when it comes to the radioactive dating methods. But hopefully it will give you a much better idea of how we know the ages of rocks and how long different geological processes take. I should also mention just how much work it takes to collect this kind of data. Just preparing some of these samples for the analysis can take weeks of very hard lab work. And that's before you factor in the time it took to go and collect the rock samples in the first place and the time it takes afterwards to interpret the data and then write that up into papers so that other scientists can read about what you've learned. No one method is best for all situations. They all have their upsides and downsides. That's why geologists like me try to use different methods that overlap. We're like detectives trying to find all of the evidence and piece it together so we can get a more complete picture of Earth history. And the same sort of principle applies when you're trying to work out how old things are or how long various geological processes took. I hope you've enjoyed today's episode as much as I've enjoyed making it. Did any of this surprise you? Do you know how old the rocks are that are near you? Was there an aspect of anything I've talked about today that you'd like to hear more detail on? If so, let me know in the comments below. <laughs> what a goon. As ever, I would really super appreciate it if you gave this video a big thumbs up. And also, if you subscribe to the channel as well, you can also find me on various social media sites on the internet. Links in the description below. Until next time, take care, see you later, bye bye.